Hey, hey, everybody, and welcome back to the board meeting. Today, we are going to be ranking games. We are ranking all of the games that Stonemeyer has come out to date. They have 17 games that have come out so far. Now, Stonemeyer is one of the most popular companies out there. They're kind of divisive, too. There's people that are really big fanboys of them, and then other people just hate them. They hate everything that they do in the board game community. But whether what you feel about them is irrelevant to this video, they are a very popular, successful board game company. And it's a rather small company for what I understand as well. There's only a few people that, you know, are, are sort of involved with this company, which is pretty impressive. Uh, myself, my feelings about Stonemeyer as far as their games, I have really like some of their games and some of their games have kind of been averaged or a little bit below average to me. But what they do do usually is they have a really good production product actually when it comes to their games. And uh, like I said, they've got 17 different games. So we're going to be ranking them. And uh, of course, this is my personal preference to which games I like best. And some, some people aren't going to like where I play some of them. Just make sure to comment down below your your preferred uh, ranking of all of these Stonemaier games. So let's get into it. And we are starting with, it's. I'm not even going to say it's number 17 because this is the one game from Stonemaier that I haven't played. So it's going to be omitted from this list, basically. This is My Little Scythe. This is the kid's version of Scythe. This is a family-friendly version of that. And I've never had a chance to play it. And from what I heard, it's a it's a fantastic kids game. But I wasn't going to go on out and hunt this down for a big price for it because it's you know it's a kids game. I wouldn't have anyone really to play this game with. But I've heard nothing but good things about this for of My Little Scythe. So yeah, that's the the one game that I haven't played. So we're going to start with the other sixteen. So now we're going to the ranking number number sixteen. Now number sixteen is a a small little micro game. This is Smitten. Now, this was a game that Jamie Stegmeier made. I believe it was for the 10-year anniversary of Stonemaier. And it's just a tiny little game for one to two players where you're playing out these cards in order to try to basically build these two images exactly alike. And you're playing these cards that have powers on them, and it's going to affect the other images or the other image. And you're just trying to make the exact same image for both of these spots. And... uh it's it's an okay game, especially it's it costs less than ten dollars or so, and I thought it was okay. I played it, I think like seven or eight times the first day that I got it, but to me it doesn't really have much replay value. You know, you play it a couple times and you've played the game. So I played it like seven or eight times that first day, and then I pretty much haven't broken out since because you see everything that that game is very quickly. You know, it's a 10 minute game. I still don't think it's a bad game for being, you know, less than $10, but it's not one that I'm going to come back to. I have no need to come back to this game. So yes, number 16 is Smitten. Going to number 15. Number 15 has its fans. It definitely does for sure. This is Euphoria. Now this is a dice worker placement game. And I have to admit, I have only played this game one time. This is the game that I've played the least amount out of all these other games. But it's also a game that after I bought it and I played it, I didn't really feel the want to come back to it for some reason or another. But it's a pretty complex, you know, dice worker placement game, which I usually love dice worker placement games. But for some reason, uh, this one just didn't vibe with me the right way, I guess. I, don't, I didn't really like how the looks of it. I didn't really like some of the dice, how they looked and stuff. And it just, then it sat on my shelf for like three or four years and eventually I sold it. So... Number 15 is Euphoria, but like I said, I've only played it the one time, and it just didn't click with me, so I never went back to it. Going to number 14. Number 14 is a legacy-style game. This is Charterstone, and a lot of people like Charterstone as well. This is a worker placement game. Like I said, it's a campaign-style legacy game. You're placing things on the board. I played this one just on Steam, and it was okay. But my problem was that it was a legacy game, a campaign style game, but the story didn't hook me at all. And that really hurt the the game mechanics for me. Because if I'm playing like a legacy style campaign game, I want to feel the story. I want to be interested in the story. This one, it was just 
purely mechanical and I didn't care about the story. The mechanics are fine. It's your work replacement game. You're going to be unlocking stuff here and there. But it's just, I I think I played seven games of it and I never, I never even finished the campaign for this. So yes, uh, number 14 is Charter Storm. Going to the next one. The next one is Between Two Cities. This is a city building game, but you're going to be building two cities with a person on your right you're building a city and a person on your left you're building a city. So you're going to be drafting these tiles around. You're going to pick two of these tiles. You're going to pick one to put on your left and one to pick on put on your right. You're cooperating with these people on your right and left to build those particular cities. It is number 13 because it is a very basic city building game. You know, you want this city, this tile ne to be next to these tiles, and that's going to be worth points. It's a very basic scoring system for the city building. Very basic city building. The gimmick of it is you are building two cities and you're cooperating with the person on your right, cooperating with the person on your left. Uh, the gimmick is not that interesting, and the city building aspect is just very basic. So it's it's a fine it's fine is how I describe between two cities. I ended up getting rid of it after a few plays. I was like, it's it's okay, but I'll I'll give it away to someone else. I've got other city building games that I'd rather play than that one. Uh, going to number twelve. Number twelve is the game that made this video get delayed for so long because I just kept putting this game off. I've had it for years. This is Pendulum. This is a game that I just had no real interest in trying out. And this is a worker placement game, resource management, but you're moving up tracks. And I like that part of it. But there is a huge catch to this game. There's a huge gimmick to this. This is a real-time game. You are going to be flipping over these timers on these spots. And when you place a timer on a spot, it's a sand timer, you can no longer place workers on those particular spots that have the sand timers. But you can, if you've placed a worker on there before, then you can activate that spot and do whatever their, their particular spot does, that action for it. And... The, the reason why it's lower, even though I really like the Euro-style part of this game, is that real-time element. I love the the thing that we are collecting all these resources, putting these workers out, and trying to move up these tracks as efficiently as you possibly can. The real-time element for this game kind of really hurts it for me. I don't like that part of it. If you had just placed, had this game without the real-time element, without the fiddly sand timers... I think this game would be much higher on this list. I would like it much more. But I know some people do enjoy this one. But this one did get kind of critically slammed by a lot of people as well because of that real-time element. And I get it. Um, if you are playing with someone who's really fast-paced with their brain and they can manage things, they are going to wipe you out in this game. But the, like I said, the Euro-style part of this game, I really enjoy. So yes, number 12 was Pendulum. Not going to number 11... Number 11 is basically the sequel of Between Two Cities. This is Between Two Castles of Mad King Ludwig, which is a combination of Between Two Cities and the Castles of Mad King Ludwig, which I've never played that one. But in this game, it's very much similar to Between Two Cities. It's a city-building game where you are cooperating with two people. You know, you're you're building a castle with the person on your right. You're building a castle with the person on your left. You're drafting tiles for two different rounds in this, I believe it is. And the reason why this one is higher than Between Two Cities is I like the the city building aspect much more than P Between Two Cities. Between Two Cities is very basic, and you're very, like, restricted of how you can play this. Between two, two Castles, I like the scoring of the tiles more. I like that you can get a bunch of bonus tiles, so the scoring is a little bit more complex, a little bit more innovative, where, like I said, Between Two Cities is very basic. But I, I like it. But I still, I think it's, I don't really like building the castles with two people. I'd rather build my thing with myself. And so I can do that that way. But the the gimmick is a gimmick. So, I mean, some people do enjoy that. But that's one, I do like the game. But it's just a little bit off for me. Going to number 10. And I would say from 10 on, these are games that I do rate maybe a little bit above average. Starting with number 10, number 10 is a game that released, it was last year, it was a big splash, this is Expeditions. This is the sequel to Scythe, this is this was toted as a sequel to Scythe, but it's basically just the sequel to Scythe in name, theme, setting, 
but the mechanics of it are very different than Scythe. But this is a big giant game with big giant tiles and you're moving these big giant mechs around. But what it comes down to, it is like this little small engine building card game. And the reason why it's lower on this list is that I think it just takes too long. And there's not really much difference between playing this as two player as four player. The map doesn't change, but the time length does. So if you're playing this as four players, it's going to take a long time to play this game more than I want to play. But as a two player game, I think this works really well. It's still fun. The card game, the card game system of it is really fun. And yeah, so number 10 is Expeditions. Going to number nine. Number nine is a roll and write game. And I would say this is probably the best quality production value for a roll and write that I've ever played. This is Rolling Realms. This is a really interesting idea that Jamie Stegmeier had. And he he made this game as a print and play during the pandemic where everybody was stuck at home. And in this game, he he's taking the games that he has created and making them into little roll and write games. And each round you're going to take three of these little games and play them in a roll and write game. And then you have three rounds. So you're basically playing these nine little worlds, but he is, you know, so he's has 17 games that he has his little worlds for, but he's started to make little expansions from other companies as well. So there are tons and tons of little expansions, you know, from other companies. There's like Architects of the West Kingdom. There's an Arc Nova expansion. And it's, it's a fun little roll and write game that has a very high quality production. Like I said, um, it's, it's interesting. It's every game feels a little bit different because of the different games you are playing within that game. So yes, number nine is Rolling Realms. Going to number eight. Number eight is a game that is based on a card game and the theme is based on an IP. I really like the card game and I really like the IP. This is Red Rising. The the card game that this is based on is Fantasy Realms. It it takes that the mechanics of that little card game and puts it more into a board game sense where there's a little bit more going on. But basically you have a hand of cards and you are trying to get these cards to synchronize with each other to score the most points. Like if you have this person, he does really well with this type of person. So you want to get that other person in your hand as well. And it's, it's based on the Red Rising IP, the book series. And the book series is one of my favorite book series of all time. So I was really excited when this game got announced. And I got to play it, and I'm playing through it, and I'm like, oh, this character, you know, this is from this. And I love that part of it. It's one of my favorite book series. And I think it's a really solid game uh, that didn't get, like, a lot of love when it came out. So, yes, number eight is Red Rising. Going to number seven, number seven is the, is it the newest one? It is the newest one that has come out. This is a sequel of another game. This is Wormspan, which is based on Wingspan. The the mechanics of Wingspan they've brought over to Wormspan. Wormspan is dealing with dragons rather than birds, but is, it is the same type of structure where you're placing out these dragons out on these areas and sort of building an engine and activating that engine. There's... There's quite a few differences between Wormspan and Wingspan. I've made a whole video about comparing the two. But I don't, it's not like a direct retheme. But it is close to Wingspan where you're like, okay, this is obviously very influenced by Wingspan. Uh, I think it's fun. It runs a little bit longer than Wingspan, a little bit longer than I prefer. But I th still think it's really fun. A really, you're building really big engines in this one. So if you like engine building games, I think you're going to like Wormspan. So now you got number seven, Wormspan, going to number six. Number six is a big, giant game. This is Tapestry. This is toted as a civilization game. But what this really is, is you are moving up on these four different tracks that are around the board, and each track specializes in a certain thing, and you're going to do different actions while you're moving up that board, and there's a lot going on in Tapestry. And there's everybody has these big, powerful, special factions that they are playing as, and those factions are really, really fun. There has been, like, erratas and stuff to fix the imbalances of this game that, like, you know, because it, it got kind of trashed right away, like, hey, these, these factions are obviously not balanced. He came out with an errata to kind of fix that. I don't worry about that. Whenever I play games, I don't worry about if the factions aren't, like, super, super balanced. I worry about, are the factions fun? And that 
that accomplishes it in this game. I find the factions to be very fun in Tapestry. I like moving up tracks, so of course I would like this game. So yeah, number six is Tapestry. Going to number five, number five is a game that got reprinted and Stonemeyer made it and they updated a couple different things. This is Libertalia Winds of Galecrest, I think the subtitle is. This is based on Libertalia, which is like a pirate game. This is a card playing game where you're playing out cards in these rows. Everybody has the same cards, which are people, and they have different numbers on them and different special abilities. Everybody's going to pick one of these characters each turn and lay these cards down simultaneously. And whoever's got the lowest card is going to be able to activate first, and they're going to do all their special abilities. Then you're going to come back around and take these tiles that are going to give you give you points for different things or do different special actions. It's a really fun game. It can be very mean, but I think it's a very enjoyable game for sure. I've never played the original Libertalia, and because right now it's really expensive to get the Libertalia, the regular one, because it went out of print. And I, I've seen it in the stores go for like 150, 200 bucks. I'm like, no, I'm not going to try it. So when they announced this, like a reprint, I'm like, oh, I'm finally going to get to be able to try out Libertalia. And I guess there's more different people in this one to make it a little bit more variability from game to game. I really enjoy it. I've really enjoyed my few plays of Libertalia. So yep, number five, Libertalia Winds of Galecrest. Going to number four. Number four is a game that came out last year as well. This is Apiary. This is a worker placement game where you're placing out your these bees, and these bees are your workers, and they have a number on them. When these bees come back, they're going to get upgraded, and they're going to be they're going to have be a better version of themselves next time you put those those workers out. So your workers get better and better as the game goes on, until finally they get off the board and they start over at one. I really like this game. I like the worker placement aspect of it. I like how you're upgrading your workers. I like the different special actions that you can do when you finally do get like a level four worker. You can do these big, powerful actions. It's very fun. You can you get these cards that are going to do really super creative things. I, I've really enjoyed Apiary. Am I like, I've played it probably 10 times now and I've really enjoyed it. I've played it very differently each game. So it's been a very good game. I was really excited that how much I liked this when this first came out last year. Uh, going into the th the top three now, these these are like the holy trinity of Stonemaier games for myself and for a lot of people. These are games that are all in my top, I would say, 20 to 25 games. These are games that I've played dozens and dozens of times each. Starting with another worker placement game, this is Viticulture World. This In this game, you are, you know... In this vineyard, you are creating your wine and selling it, and it's a, got a very interesting worker placement aspect to it. Where and you got to play with the expansion for this for sure. That makes it even better. It's really good without the expansion, but I think the expansion just adds more. But you're placing out these workers in certain seasons, and during the season you can play some workers out on that season to do those spots, or you can pass and do st do stuff in the next season. And it's just a really engaging game. It's fun, fun worker placement game. And it has these visitor cards that a lot of people don't seem to really like. If people complain about Viticulture, it's usually about these visitor cards that are going to do these special actions that are going to be awesome and game-breaking. But that's one of the reasons why I like this game so much is because of those visitor cards. Because they're so fun. It's like, I'm I'm doing this and everybody's like, what? Whoa, that... That changes the game, and I have really enjoyed that aspect of Viticulture. So yes, number three is Viticulture. Going to the second game, the second best Stonemaier game. This was my favorite game ever for several years when it first came out, and this is Scythe. This is a big, giant, epic experience of a game where you're going to be moving around the board, and it combines Euro style with a Merit Marathrash style, where you're going to be collecting resources, using these to upgrade your systems, or or you're going to be going out and fighting other people with your big giant mechs. And there's there's a perfect balance between them. It's such a good mixture of Euro meets Amerithrash. And I have really enjoyed this over the years. I've played it dozens and dozens of times. I've also played it on Steam a lot as well 
over the years because after a while you know it wasn't coming to the table as much and you download on steam and it works really well on there as well and uh, so i've just really really liked scythe for a long time like i said it used to be my favorite game of all time and it just dropped down a little bit just because i've played it so much over the years but yes number two is scythe now going to number one number one is a game and if you're keeping track you know which what game this is this is a game that people either love or they hate this is wingspan of course it's number one for me so i obviously love it this is a game you know there was wormspan but before wormspan was wingspan and i think wingspan is just a better game than wormspan and you're putting out these birds in these rows building a little bit of an engine there are three different expansions so far for this game and they intend to make several more expansions for it there are tons and tons of birds in this game with tons and tons of different abilities and it because of all that those expansions and that variability there's just every game you're like how am i going to build my engine this game and you're you can't just go in with like a strategy this game i'm going to do this you're going to have to adjust for what birds are available for you to get into that worker that engine building aspect to it but i've played it a lot over the last few years and it's still one of my all-time favorite games i still will always say yes if someone wants to play wingspan but like i said a lot of people really hate on wingspan i don't get it i think it's a good game even if you didn't necessarily like it there are people that think it's a one in absolutely no way is this game a one and you might not like it but i i love it so yes that is all of the stonemeyer games that have come out since that company got announced overall i th these are a really good list of of games for them i don't think there's any terrible games on this list at all i think there are really great games good games and average games and maybe a little bit below average games so yeah i've i've enjoyed stonemeyer over the years i'm excited i'm always excited for new games that get announced by Stonemaier, because I'm like, this could potentially be one of my favorite games, just like the top three, three games that I just mentioned. But that will complete this video, so make sure to comment down below your thoughts on on Stonemaier. Rank your favorite Stonemaier games for me, because I think that'll be very interesting. Of course, we're not going to agree on everything. Either way, if you did enjoy this video, make sure to like and subscribe to see more weekly content. From me, Shane, at the board meeting in the future. Hope you all have an amazing day. Take care.